Om Ajnati Madandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Nena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha In essence, the translation of the mantra is, O my Lord, O energy of the Lord, please engage me in your service. And this is the safe position for everyone to be a servant because there is a way in which that's our constitutional position. And everyone's serving one way or another in this world. But the best service is the service through which one is giving one service to the divine. Then there's satisfaction. According to the Srimad Bhagavatam, only this kind of service, which is unmotivated, and only don't, it's, in other words, it's being done uh, service for service, not for any return. And it's uninterrupted. There are no other distractions can satisfy the self. So this way of connecting to Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is very practical in this present age where there are many complexities and distractions. And if one connects oneself to the chanting process of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. He or she will feel a natural satisfaction. It'll be hard to tell where it's coming from. It's coming from the mantra. There's spiritual power in the mantra. And there's also knowledge that comes from the mantra. Everything needed to advance in spiritual life comes from repeating the mantra. So there's several ways it can be done. One is the way we just did it, chanting together sometimes like I just came from the East Coast and there there was a musician who brought his guitar and he was strumming the guitar various tunes so guitar is sort of it's a melodious instrument but it's also a rhythm instrument at the same time it can keep the uh, <clears throat> the tempo going the tempo and the melody at the same time and you can chant along with that. There are, there are no hard and fast rules for chanting. You don't have to do it particularly like this. Others, while they're out on their surfboards, they'll chant Hare Krishna, and they'll look at the ocean, and they'll think, where did this vast body of water come from? And they'll remember, it's coming from somewhere beyond my imagination. And the mantra takes you to that place, that source of everything. While you're driving in your car, Good idea, keep the Maha Mantra going. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Because it's a very stressful driving in the car, unknown to us most of the time, that at any second we're close to death when we're driving in a car, statistically speaking. And anybody who's ever had an accident realizes how precarious it actually is. While cooking, you can chant the Maha Mantra. Being uh, absorbed in cooking, you can think about the cooking the food in such a way that you're uh, spiritually minded. You make it as an offering to God before you eat it. And then the consciousness of the person who's cooking goes into the food. That's a very practical thing. While you're at work, in between talking to patients, if you're a doctor, or while you're doing an operation, you can keep the mantra going. If you're a musician, you can go on stage and you can wow the audience by chanting the Maha Mantra. Some musicians have done this to great effect. Nina Hagen used to chant Hare Krishna. She was a pop musician, New York, popular in the 1980s. Haven't heard of her since. George Harrison was famous for chanting the Hare Krishna in the, in the song My Sweet Lord and at other times. Boy George chanted Hare Krishna. Hari Ram, Hari Krishna. How, how did that lyric go? Bow down, Mr. Hari Ram, Hari Krishna. I forget. And um, uh, many others. So musicians can, can integrate the mantra into their, into their singing and performances uh, so that others can hear it. Nowadays, there are actually, oh, this, was, this is a newer phenomenon, at least in the last decade, that uh, p people actually go to concerts which are dedicated just to this kind of chanting. 
even professional musicians are taking to what they call kirtan, rather than singing country music or any other kind of genre, rock and roll or whatever, what kind of music do you play? And they say kirtan has become popular. So some of them also chant the Maha Mantra at, at certain times. So in any way, it's flexible. The Maha Mantra can be worked into one's life. Then also, uh, if one is extremely eager to contact the Supreme and more quickly and more intimately, one can organize uh, one's day so that one can wake up in the morning and sit down somewhere in a quiet place in the home. If you have one, do that. Otherwise, go to the park or somewhere else like the library. Or if you're near an airport, I guarantee you there's a beautiful place at the airport. Practically almost every airport has a meditation room. I was just at the New Jersey airport and I stopped into their meditation room. Nobody else goes there. Everyone else is in a hurry. <laughs> They're always empty. And in San Francisco, there's a, a yoga room over by uh, the Virgin Airlines terminal. If you go in there, there's a yoga room. Nobody in there. And you can sit down and you can chant. So find a place early in the morning and then you repeat the mantra. You sit down and repeat the mantra and listen to the sound vibration. The mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. 16 words, 32 syllables. And each uh, word is a name of God and it has the spiritual power. So if you just repeat it with your tongue, you engage your tongue, and then you listen with your ears. This is yoga. And the Padma Purana, which is a famous yoga scripture, says that this is the best way to start yoga, and it's the way to come to the perfection of yoga, is with your tongue. So the tongue is an interesting instrument, if you think about it for a minute. All the work the tongue does for us every day, it's constantly working. It's either eating something, tasting something, or saying something, and we really need it for a lot of things. And sometimes it does more than we ask it to. <laughs> it kind of has a mind of its own, right? Or is it just me? I just uh, experience this, I'll have one of these uh, sweets, and then you start walk away and go, I'll have another. You <laughs> Before you're even finished, you turn around to take the next one. The tongue's like, and I'll have five more. And so, uh, yoga, yoga begins with the tongue, interestingly. I'll give the Sanskrit for that for proof, which says, Atashri Krishna Namadi Nabaved Grahimindriye Sevan Mukhi Jivado Swayameva Spuratyada. Which that's, this says, remarkably, that yoga, yoga, which is the linking of the, the Atma or the spiritual self to the Supreme, begins with the tongue. Where else would you begin? If you're going to start an exercise regimen, where else would you start? But by walking around the block, right? Don't neglect to do what you can do just because you think you're not doing enough. Do what you can do now. So walk around the block, begin yoga with the tongue, and if you repeat the ma mantra, then you're in for a big surprise. There's magic and power in the maha mantra itself. So for home practice, find yourself a quiet place at home and sit down and just repeat the Maha Mantra as a kind of meditation and listen to the sound. Let it go into your ears and just be there with the mantra. Your mind has a tendency to wander. My mind has a tendency to wander. And this is confirmed in, in all the bhakti, all the yoga scriptures of the world. For instance, the uh, Yoga Sutra, which has become more popular nowadays because many people are practicing asanas. And asanas are one part of the eight-step path of yoga, eight-fold path of yoga. The very beginning, uh, chitta vritti uh, nirodha, which means that the goal of this yoga is to quiet the mind, uh, finally, so that one can actually see things as they are and not be disturbed by the mind. And there are many steps that one has to go through to come to that point. But this is kind of a shortcut process. By chanting the maha mantra and listening to the sound, because of the spiritual power of the mantra, if we give, do our part and pay attention to the mantra and absorb the mantra by not looking at too many other things, 
bringing the mind back to the mantra and so forth, then the mantra will infuse us with spiritual knowledge, of the power to control the senses, and ultimately, the supreme personality of Godhead, Krishna, whose name we're calling out when we chant the mantra, will reveal himself to us by that chanting process. What do you think, Mukharavinda? Yes, good idea? Good practice? And sometimes when we practice something, we'll have good days and bad days. So remember that because sometimes you'll feel that uh, you're getting more than you deserve when you put in a little bit of effort to chant the Maha Mantra. And other days, no matter how hard you try, you won't get anything. But that's the plight of the practitioner. You have to go on. And you also have to cultivate a little bit of knowledge that there's something there for you so that you're encouraged to go on day after day. Any questions or, or reflections about the chanting process before going to another subject? Yes. Shraddha Devi Dasi. Amaraj, what is the cause of the bad days? I mean, sometimes I just have bad days, although there's such a strong desire to chant properly, but it still ends up being bad. Well, that's just our perspective that it's a bad day. It's all good. <laughs> but but the, the, the mind vacillates. It moves all over the place, and, and there are ups and downs when we chant. So we, could, we can be aware, aware of the fact, number one, that when you're trying, when you're taking the medicine, it's having its effect even if you can't see it. So you've got to keep that in mind. Uh, sometimes uh, people take uh, medicine, they don't feel the effect right away. Or example I've given is that in San Francisco when it's foggy, you can go out and walk around and you'll get a sunburn because the, the ultraviolet rays come through the fog. So even in those times when you feel like you're not in ecstasy or you're not getting some kind of high experience, you should still understand that something's coming through because you're trying, right? What is the cause of the bad days? According to the scripture, the yoga scriptures, uh, the mind is the cause of good and bad days. Because the mind goes, it goes around and around. This is called um, chitra, chitta vritti, it means it has ripples. Like if there's a lake and it's very clear, you can see everything at the bottom. But when there's wind, it makes uh, these blemishes, these ripples on the top of the lake. And then it's, it becomes opaque, you can't see anything down there. And the mind has vrittis. The mind is, is normally a clear surface, but it gets disturbed by various uh, impressions that uh, we introduce through the various senses. And they'll come in and they'll disturb the mind. And they're not just from today. You may think, I didn't even watch anything today that could have disturbed my mind or heard anything. But there are also impressions, according to the, the yoga scriptures, from previous lives that carry over. We, we carry these impressions for many lifetimes. And uh, they come up in the way uh, storms come up on the ocean. One day can be clear, and the next day you're being tossed like anything in the waves. Prabhupada recounted his experience coming across. Prabhupada is the, the one who started the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And to get to America the first time, he took a boat. So he didn't have any money, but someone gave him free passage on a, on a cargo ship. And he has a, had this experience of traveling for many weeks on the cargo ship and the vast ocean that one day would be very clear and smooth, and the next day or the next hour there would be a huge storm and everyone would be holding on because it would be rocking. So the mind is like that also. There are storms that just come up. Why? Because of previous contact with the uh, causes of the vrittis, which disturb the mind. But there's a way in which, by practice, one can make the mind one's friend. The mind can become controlled. Uh, Krishna says in the Gita that, that if the mind's unbridled, then it's very disturbing. But through yoga, the mind can become our friend. When we learn to control the mind, 
by regulation. That's one of our one of the main uh, processes for calming the mind is regulation. When you regulate the senses, you can bring them under control. And also by practicing the um, processes of yoga, bhakti yoga, especially the chanting process on a regular basis. There's a, a law in mathematics called the law of large numbers. I mean, it says that the more you perform a particular experiment, bona fide experiment, then uh, the more consistent the result will become. If you do a couple of experiments, you may get a very different result. Like sometimes I've seen people, they try something and it doesn't work the first time, so they say, well, it just doesn't work. We'll try it 10 more times. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, it worked uh, one time out of 10, then you have some hope. And if you do it 100 times, it may work, you know, one time out of 10, and then you have 10 successes, and you start to build on that. So when you're chanting, you may have success some days, and, and you may be disturbed other days, but the law of large numbers is very helpful. If you keep, go, keep the experiment going over a long period of time, you'll gain more confidence and so forth. Why do, why do you have good days and bad days? You just do. And you have to, your job is, as a sadhaka, means a practitioner of yoga, is to go on practicing. In fact, you can take it that during the bad days you have even more opportunity to, to uh, try to improve yourself because you have a little resistance to work with. Sometimes it helps. Any other uh, comments or questions? Yes. Thanks. Prabhuji Hare Krishna, um, the pranam mantras, in which order should I actually say before starting the chanting? I mean, there's like a number of pranam mantras, right? To understand. Pranam mantras, how should you say them? Yeah, I mean, which order should I say? Like, uh, there is like uh, Namo Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prashtaya. Is that the first one? Or should I just start with Agyana Tibirandasya? Or, you know, I just wanted to know the order in which I should say it. Right, right way to say it. Well, it, it's written in the Bhagavad Gita. It shows starting with Om Ajnana, Timirandasya, then there's several others. However, it's, it's not absolutely required to say all those pranam mantras before you start chanting. Although it is recommended that you say the, the Panchatapha mantra, Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Srivasari Gaur Bhaktivinoda Prabhupada specifically mentions that. And the pranam mantras, you could say the pranam mantra to your spiritual master, you can say the pranam mantra to, to Srila Prabhupada, founder of Acharya of Iskand, then you can chant Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya and then Hare Krishna. Is it advice to say both, like to, to the spiritual master and Srila Prabhupada as well? Yeah. Okay. That's good. Kanka? Um, when you first started talking, you were talking about um, people who were chanting Hare Krishna who were famous. And um, uh, Tom Petty and Jeff Lynne indicted George Harrison into the um, Rock and Roll uh, Hall of Fame. They said, but before he, we can indict him, everyone in the audience has to stand up and repeat. And they repeated the entire Hare Krishna mantra. Everyone who knows who Tom Petty is, raise your hand. And it was televised. One in the back. Hey, good for you. <laughs> okay, and then... It was televised all over the world. So I thought that was really amazing. Who knows who Jeff Lynn is? Raise your hand. <laughs> How do you know so much about music? <laughs> Just do. All right. Very good. Anyway, they are also rock and roll musicians, but they were indicting George Harrison. And it was them. after he had, many years after he had passed. But I thought that was amazing how his influence, and they said in order to indict him, they... And they said they made the whole audience repeat the Hare Krishna mantra. Nice. Just wanted to share that. Yeah, good for Tom Petty and Jeff Lynn. Very good. Ready for another subject? Maybe in some ways more esoteric, in other ways it may be more practical. One thing is that in this world, Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita is the 
called the Song of God, or spoken by Krishna 5,000 years ago. Uh, uh, deep words of wisdom that Krishna spoke to his disciple on the battlefield of Kukshetra, which are perfect in, in all ways. And those who read the Bhagavad Gita experience that for themselves, the completeness of Krishna's instructions, one chapter after another. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes how we are a combination of matter and spirit. In other words, we're actually spiritual, but we've somehow rather become entangled in a material body. I said that earlier, but it bears repeating because the first step in to achieving any kind of balance or happiness in life is to understand that I'm, I'm not the physical body or even the mental body, but I'm something beyond that. And to come to that position is not so easy because it almost seems like I'm my body. I think if I tell my arm to move, it moves and so forth. And I look in the mirror and I think, oh, this is me. And even one step further, I, I try on a coat or a hat and someone will say, oh, that's really you. <laughs> Anybody ever had that? You try on something and someone says, that's really you. Well, it's not really you, it's just a coat. Or, and in the same way, your body is not really you either. Although we say, that's you. Or I think that I'm seeing Mukharavind or Shraddha Devi Dasi. I'm actually only seeing the, the covering. So there's a difference between the Atma or the spirit and the body, which is a covering. And in fact, in the Gita, Krishna describes how the body itself is like a sweater or a coat. You wear it for a while, it wears out, and you get a new one. So similarly, he says, you wear this body for a little while, it wears out. Any parts wear out on anybody yet? Wait a little while, you'll see things wear out. They just naturally do, sometimes sooner than later. Sometimes they break. It's just like any other machine. It's just a biological machine, and we're riding around in the machine. Now, besides, you know, the, the obvious physical needs that everyone has on a regular basis, which are what? Eating, sleeping, mating, defending. These are sort of the natural th um, urges of the body. The, the body needs to be uh, taken care of and have some kind of uh, gratification and fuel and so forth. And then for the mind, there are certain things we need to, right? I think, I don't know the context exactly, although it seems to fit in this conversation. In the Bible, I think it says, man cannot live by bread alone. In other words, we need something more than just physical fuel. And what are some of those things that people need? What is it? Love? All you need is love? <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> oh, you all know that one, huh? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, all you need is love. We hear about it in poetry. We hear about it in song. Uh, and it's obvious. No, no man is an island. I was saying from a poem. The fact is that uh, we have social needs, too. Everyone has to socialize. Otherwise, we'll feel isolated. Um, children need love, especially when they're growing up. They're being taken care of. If, if you neglect a child... If, if you mistreat a child and so forth, there are implications, right? There's psychological needs that we have. And so, so we have this physical body that has daily needs, and you got to go and you got to grow food or buy food, and you got to make sure that it's available. You got to carry water around because the machine has to be refilled all the time. Everyone thinks, oh, it's, I'm just drinking water, but you're refilling the, the robot. And also, on a, on a very a subtle level, we actually have these very deep needs for, for social contact, for love, for um, interaction with others and so forth. We have, have to, you have to see the sky and you have to feel the ground under your feet. If you fly on an airplane for 16 hours, you just see when the plane stops, everyone stands up and says, let me out of here, because <laughs> they want to touch the ground. I remember I was coming in from a long flight. I think it was from, I came all the way from India through Thailand and Japan. I was coming into San Francisco after like 25 hours of flying. And the pilot, as we were coming down into beautiful San Francisco Bay Area, which is always nice to come back to. And part of my 
psychophysiological nature. I like the, the Bay Area. It's just natural because I grew up here. And then when I'm coming in on the flight, he said, we'll be touching down on terra firma in about five minutes. And I thought, terra firma? Oh, yeah, that's the earth. You know? <laughs> and I said, when I got down, I was like, wow, I like terra firma. I need terra firma. I got to see the water and the air and the birds flying and so forth. You got to have variety. And, and if you just stay in one place in the dark, uh, it's not enough. And even as people are flying, they have to read books. They have to talk to each other. People watch movies on the airplane and so forth. They have to have their minds stimulated. So there are these basic needs. And uh, one of the, the really important needs, which is actually intrinsic uh, to the spiritual self, is love, and it means relationships. In order to, for there to be love, there has to be two, at least. You can't, you can't just be, there's no love in oneness. There's love in two-ness and more. Because there's, there's a love and a beloved. It means there's an object of love and there's the person who loves and so forth. And according to the, the bhakti scriptures, this is the most natural thing because actually we were, there's a way in which uh, the supreme personality of Godhead expands himself. Of course, it, it's eternally manifest, but the language is limited. Therefore, it says uh, uh, he desired enjoyment and therefore he expanded himself into many. So the one and, and the God or the supreme is des described as the supreme one, the supreme whole. There's nothing else but God. But at the same time, there's variety within that oneness. And we're part of the variety. And what part are we? We're not like matter. Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego. Now these are elements, actual physical elements, which make up the physical world, which make up terra firma and everything we see around it. And they also make up our body. If you if you really boil it down, and I've done this several times because I've had several relatives die on me already and then their bodies cremated and I take the ashes and I put them in the Ganges and while I'm observing the whole process, I just think, you, you, you can see the separation, the spirit's gone, now I, well, I'm left holding a, a bag of ashes and that's what you get. So there's a, different, a difference between the two and these elements... Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego are observable, at least the gross ones. And the subtle ones we can uh, observe by their symptoms. Mm. And beyond that, there's a sp the spiritual aspect, which is the Atma or the soul. Now, because we're inside this physical body, it has uh, gross needs and subtle needs also. But beyond that, the spiritual soul itself, and I think I'm sliding here at every moment on this microphone, which is a, if somebody ever invents a microphone that doesn't do that after a few years, I think we'll have enough to spread Christian consciousness all over the Bay Area. Um, the soul itself has the uh, intrinsic nature of being a lover. And we express that when we're in a physical and mental body through the senses. And there's a way in which it gets, mm, it gets colored by our physical and mental experience. I think we're okay now. But by purifying oneself and seeing the difference and separating oneself from the conception that I'm this body, physical or mental, which comes out in the idea that I belong to this body or this is my body, and by extension that I'm an American, speaking for myself, or I would say I'm from the Bay Area, or I'm a man, or someone else say I'm a woman. But these are external designations. So the process of yoga divests the, of the actual soul of these false conceptions. And gradually one comes to understand that I'm actually an eternal soul, which is, means I'm a spiritual a part of God. And my real relationship 
is with the Supreme, with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, as we talked about the chanting of Hare Krishna, part of the, the result one will experience, according to the great teachers of bhakti, the great authorities who have passed the process down over many generations, and especially now speaking about Rupa Goswami, who's a, a good name to remember because he's the, the ch chief disciple of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who, who began the Sankirtan movement, or this teaching of the mass teaching of bhakti yoga for the whole world. Rupa Goswami encapsulated the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And one of his Sanskrit verses, which is about bhakti yoga, says, Sarvo pari vinir muktam tat nirmalam rishikena rishikesha sevanam bhaktir uchite. So this means that as one practices bhakti, the process of bhakti yoga, uh, one begins to see the difference between the spiritual self and the external coverings. And no longer thinks in terms of, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm an American, I'm a hockey player, I'm a hockey fan, or any of those types of things, but begins to see one's higher relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. And that is not something artificial or something introduced from the outside, but it, it's a natural. Uh, so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave a verse, Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadya Kabunoi Shravanadi Shuddha Chite Karai Udoi. That's in Bengali, but basically what it means is that as one practices bhakti yoga, especially uh, taking transcendental sound by chanting the names of God and also hearing the very special bhakti scriptures, which have a sound vibration that comes from the spiritual world, then gradually one becomes divested of the idea that I am a physical body and begins to see for oneself that I'm actually, I have a higher relationship with the spiritual world and with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. So uh, this happens naturally. While we're living in this world, there's a balance that has to go on because I already have these natural urges of the senses and needs of the senses. The senses have their needs. They have to be fulfilled, uh, both the gross senses and the subtle senses. And I can't simply deny those. Therefore, in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that one should balance one's life. That means that um, he calls it yukta. You should have some balance. Yukta hara viharasya, yukta cheshtasya karmasu, yukta swapnava bodasya, yogo bhavati dukaha. He says, by yukta or by balancing one's life, one can become free from misery. That's a pretty good deal. And what does he say to balance? Yukta hara, that means by eating. You should be a balanced eater. There's a concept. Not so easy to do, apparently, because we have a problem in America of obesity. It's a very big problem. When I get an anxiety, I just start eating. When I uh, you know, hear an advertisement, someone says, eat these things, I just go over and, okay, I'll do it. I'll eat it. I heard the ad, I'll take it. And so forth. It's, it's, it's difficult, but Krishna says, you should concentrate on this. You should try to balance the way you eat. Be a balanced eater. You should eat a lot of, your diet should be like a rainbow and not Skittles or, um, or M&Ms, like those colors. <laughs> what it means is, you know, like greens, like that from the vegetable kingdom, you should have foods that are like, you know, some of them are green, like name some greens. Spinach, Spinach yeah. Kale, broccoli, name some yellow, Pumpkin, squash, huh? Bell pepper, name some red. Tomato, white, how about white? White, carrot, white carrots, there are white carrots, that's a radish. <laughs> huh? All right, you get the idea. There's all these rainbow, she did a rainbow diet, balanced diet, and also she, you know, there's grains and, uh, there's healthy foods that you can take in balance, not 
uh, take one thing predominantly. And you should be careful. Don't eat too much and don't eat too little. This is, this is something that uh, you have to be careful. You know, don't overstuff yourself. The tongue may say eat more and you don't need to eat more. But if you, in that gap, if you wait a little while and you say, I, I don't need to eat more. I'm going to eat what I need. This is called yuktahara. This is a Krishna speaking. He said, balance your eating. That's important, right? Yuktahara viharasya. Uh, uh, yukta cheshasya karmasu. So eating, then comes work, the way you work. Not too much and not too little, just what you need. Then swapna means dreaming, actually. It was just sleeping. You know, the, sleep is a real mysterious thing. No one really knows what it is or why we sleep exactly. But there's a way the Ayurveda describes the body has to uh, cycle through and purify the different organs and stuff like that. But it should be balanced. It's very artificial in this day and age how people sleep because electric lights stay on all night. And there's a way that the body reacts to light. It's a machine. And when it sees the lights go down, then it, then it naturally starts, to, the hormones change and it puts you to sleep. But if you keep a light on all the time, <laughs> then the body's like overstimulated and you're, you're up all night. And you know, it's, so Krishna says, regulate your sleep. It's a little more difficult in this age because of all the electric lights and the way we fly through time zones and all these kinds of things. But if you just do that, regulate your sleep, Regulate the way you, you recreate. Recreate means recreate. You've got to recreate yourself every day. It means you've got to uh, you know, give yourself what you need so that you can actually be healthy. So he says, yoga bhavati dukaha. Dukaha, you can kill all miseries if you're just balanced like this. And another important aspect of, of life is you have to have uh, loving, happy relationships in your life. In fact, if you have that, it's really true. All you need is love. Because if you have that, there's a lot of other things that you can forego if you have happy, balanced, loving relationships. So this is true in devotional service as well, and it's recommended by Rupa Goswami, the, the great authority on bhakti yoga. He says in his uh, famous book, which is called The Essence of All Teachings on Bhakti Yoga, uh, Nectar of Instruction. It's a condensed version which gives you, you know, if you had to go to a desert island, you didn't have it, couldn't take any other book, and you just had this one book, you'd be able to recreate, recreate all the teachings that he got from, from Lord Chaitanya. This is the genius of Rupa Swami. Everything's in there in just a few verses. It explains the whole process. And, of course, now we have... Prabhupada unpacked a lot of it through his purports. It gives explanations. But one very important verse in that book, before he even gets to the, the talking about chanting and meditating and all these things, he goes through some basic uh, things that you should follow in your life. He starts off with saying what I said, which is control your tongue. <laughs> Don't think about being a big shot before you can control your tongue. Don't be, think about claiming that you're a big yogi or a philosopher or anything until you can actually control your tongue. If you can do that, you really don't have to prove yourself in any other way because practically nobody can control their tongue in this world. The tongue rules, rules the whole world. Everyone wants to blah, blah, blah. And <laughs> they just can't help themselves. And they, they just, you know, they'll, they'll ruin their whole career They'll get themselves killed just because the tongue is like, okay, be quiet, and blah, blah, blah. And next thing, they're ruined. And then eating and eating and eating and eating all kinds of things that actually cause damage to not only the physical body, but also the mental body. So if you can control the tongue, you're halfway there. And that's what he starts off with, very practical advice, right? Then he gets off, he starts to describe there's other senses in the body, and if you can... If you can learn to regulate and control those other senses, then this is the beginning of yoga. Regulate the senses. Next, he, he goes into talking about practical things, how to live your life in a balanced way. And he says, don't over-collect. Don't, um, don't chatter about nonsense. 
Don't speak unnecessarily about things that you don't need to talk about. Don't overeat. Um, he goes into then positive things. For instance, uh, learn to be enthusiastic and uh, be patient. It's like, what great advice, you know? Some it's not working. Be patient <laughs> and be determined. So these the few in the categories leading up, and then the next verse he comes out with, he says that you should have loving relationships. Loving relationships with other devotees, with other people who are interested, who are on the path of spiritual life. This is a necessity. It's one of the necessities of, the, of life. You have to have it. And it, not only for, for the mind and the senses, but also for the soul. And if you have relationships, loving relationships with others, who are on the process of, in the process of advancing spiritually, then you have a very good chance of making it to the higher levels of practice and devotional service. You have a question? Okay. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, when you say loving relationships, sometimes I think of um, the temple more as an Alcoholics Anonymous. We come in once, twice, or thrice a week, and you know, um, how do we define a loving relationship? We may get advice, we may get counseling, we may all be having the same common dilemmas, we're having the same issues that we go through, come in and come out of. And we share that, but how does a group like AA and us, how do we differ? Where, where's that strong difference? When you say loving relationship, what does it mean? I don't know everything about AA except that it's a, there's a process, a 12 step process, uh, which is helpful in organizing people's lives who have addictions because overcoming addiction takes help from the outside. And uh, you have to have association and help and so forth. Uh, I think that the, the difference is that, uh, as in with many other processes, there's a, somewhere much further to go in the process of uh, bhakti yoga under the teachings of Rupa Goswami. Uh, you know, there's, there's a way in which even in the Vedas, there's all kinds of, of uh, helpful knowledge about how to live one's life in a balanced way, but it's not enough. In fact, Vyasadev, the author of the Vedas, became morose after compiling them all and came to his spiritual master and said, I'm just not feeling right. I, I, I'm not inspired in my service. I don't know what's wrong. And his spiritual master, Narada Muni, told him that you haven't been specific enough about the pastimes of Krishna, describing them, because it's the only thing that will actually bring one this satisfaction that one's looking for. So it's a very specific kind of knowledge that's available through the process of bhakti under the teachings of Rupa Goswami that is not available through AA. I know that as a fact. Because they, they talk about a higher power and they say, go out and find your higher power whatever it may be, which is good advice. It's, it's a good process. But it, it doesn't have enough. It doesn't have enough. Is that okay? I hope I didn't say anything wrong against AA. Oh, no, anything. no. I, I only used it as an example to get to a sense of a sure. concept where we meet once a week or twice a week to work out our whole week's problems, you know, bring out the topic that hurts us most, and then work with it and go back. So well, we come and go, come and let go. Let me, before we take any more questions, because questions will take us adrift, possibly. No, no, you, your questions are good, and your question was going to be good, too, if you can hold on to it for a little bit. I'm just, by adrift, I mean, it, it's going in a wider direction. And I think that the, the direction I'm going in, in the time we have left, may be going in, maybe give you what you want to hear, Okay. So a couple of things that, that may sound astounding, but the reason I took so much time to talk about the balance between matter and spirit uh, was to lead up to these possibly shocking verses that I'm going to read now, at the risk of you know, everyone walking out, or you know, the internet shutting down, everyone leaving. <laughs> Doug's here for the first time. He may say, never talk to these people again. OK, so here it is. Uh, 
a couple of verses that talk about this interesting way in which there's a balance between matter and spirit. And keep in mind, as I read these verses, that the ultimate goal of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is a bhakti scripture, which teaches the, the highest goal in bhakti, is to bring us to a spiritual relationship, a loving spiritual relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, and his devotees. And there are, we obviously have many other kind of relationships in this world, correct? Yes or yes? yes. Like what? What other kind of relationships do we have in this world? Mothers, sisters, brothers, sons, daughters, father, son. So all, all these relationships are there. Thanksgiving is a time people go out of their way to get on a plane, jump in a car. They have to go to see the family. And it's, you know, it's a time some people dread, but at the same time there's kind of a mixed feelings. <laughs> Yeah, there's mixed feelings. You know, they have to go see their family. That's their roots, even if they may have, you know, strained relationships. And most people do, because not all relationships are just, you know, smooth, <laughs> right? And family relationships can get really complicated and so forth, but it's a natural thing, right? So Bhagavatam's giving advice about how to live in this world and at the same time cultivate our relationship with Krishna. Shall I read the verses? Yes. You're all sitting down, right? Yes. Okay. This is from Srimad Bhagavatam 714, 3 through 4. 714, 3 through 4. This comes in a long section of instruction about how to live a balanced life. This, this, the Bhagavatam has a lot of information about this because people have to have relationships in this world, right? Yes. Correct? Correct, Vaisheshi Gadas. Okay, so this verse says, a grahasta. Now, a grahasta, griha in Sanskrit means a house. And a grahasta means somebody who lives in a house. And the implication is that you got a lot of stuff and you got a lot of relationships and you got to work for it all. Okay, so a grahasta must associate again and again with saintly persons. And with great respect, he must hear the nectar of the activities of the Supreme Lord and his incarnations, as these activities are described in Srimad Bhagavatam. Again, the Srimad Bhagavatam is a, a book about uh, bhakti yoga, and it describes the spiritual world and our relationship with the Supreme Personality of God at Krishna. So I'll read that sentence again. A grahasta must associate again and again. What's a grahasta? person who lives in four walls, they got a lot of stuff and a bunch of relationships, they got to work hard. Okay, a grahasta must associate again and again with saintly persons and with great respect. With what? Great he must hear the nectar of the activities of the Supreme Lord and his incarnations as these activities are described in the Srimad Bhagavatam and other Puranas. Puranas means histories. There's histories about the, uh, the human society and all various incarnations of God who have appeared at different times in history. Thus, one should gradually become detached from affection for his wife and children, exactly like a man awakening from a dream. And I'll read an excerpt from the purport. In a dream, we form a society of friendship and love, and when we awaken, we see that it has ce ceased to exist. Similarly, one's gross society, family, and love are also a dream. And this dream will be over as soon as one dies. Therefore, whether one is dreaming in a subtle way or a gross way, these dreams are all false and temporary. One's real business is to understand that one is soul, aham brahmasmi, and that his activities should therefore be different than one can be, ha be happy. So this advice given to those who are grahastas and have family relationships. Now, it's describing that these relationships are like a dream. So now, how should one act in these family relationships? It's saying it's like a dream that ultimately it's superfluous to our life, so 
We should just be indifferent to our spouse and our children and our um, parents and everybody else, right? Treat them coldly? No. No. Okay, let's read the next verse. So in the next verse, you'll find 7.14.5. says, While working to earn his livelihood as much as necessary to maintain body and soul together, one who is actually learned should live in human society unattached to family affairs, although externally appearing very much attached. How does that strike you? What's that? It's the opposite of what we usually do. Opposite of what we usually do. Okay, so we can realign ourselves now. So this is a nice project. So I'll read it again. While working to earn his livelihood as much as necessary, which is, is a point also, as much as necessary, Prabhupada goes in to describe that. Um, it's not so vital that you find the perfect career and so forth. He, he emphasizes that you should find what works. And this is pretty much the mood of this idea of balancing everything. Find what works for you and then do it because you're in and out of this place really fast. This place means the material, <laughs> this body, this situation you're in. You're in and out. Don't worry. Don't stress about it too much. If it was sent to you, you have it. You're working on it. You went to school for engineering, for instance, just as a long shot, and you happen to have a degree in, in electrical engineering, then use it. You know, it's, don't worry about it so much. Take, take what you have and do what you need to do to, to keep going. Well, uh, while working to earn his livelihood as much as necessary to maintain body and soul together, one who is actually learned should live in human society unattached to family affairs, although externally appearing very much attached. And the word in the verse itself is rakta vat. Vat means like or as, appearing as. So rakta, as if attached. Rakta means to be attached. So rakta vat means you should externally be like you're an attached person. So in the Srimad Bhagavatam fifth canto, first part, there's a story of Maharaj Priyavrata, who is a, a, a great advanced spiritual person. And he was uh, taking direct instruction from Narada Muni, who was telling him, take the path of renunciation in life and don't look back. And then along comes Priyavrata's father, who is? Yes. And he explains, Swami Bhuvamanu, and he explains to them that you, you, you have to actually uh, take some responsibility. And at that time, it meant he had to become a king, which means management. It also means family life and so forth. And uh, even Brahma came to convince him. And the very interesting in this beginning part of the fifth canto, there's descriptions. Uh, in the 516, at the very end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, while chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, the words Krishna and Hare immediately remind him, the chanter, of all the Lord's activities. Since entire life, since his entire life is engaged in the service of the Lord, a devotee cannot forget the Lord at any time. Just as an ordinary man always engages his mind in material activities, a devotee always engages his mind in spiritual activities. This is called Brahma Satra or meditating on the Supreme Lord always. Prince Priyavrata was perfectly initiated into this practice by Sri Narada. Then we go to text number 12 at the end of the purport. And this, this is an interesting section of the purport where Prabhupada describes that you're, you may be confronted in your life with hard decisions. Definitely. There'll be times you're not sure which way to go. And therefore, this word in the verse is called manishaya, which means that one must be intelligent to try to figure out what to do. Now, Priyavrata had already decided he was going to renounce, and he was just going to stay focused on uh, his meditation throughout his life. 
And then all these authorities came to him, his father, and the, Brahma, his grandfather. And at that time, people just didn't disregard what, you know, they would, these were bona fide authorities and they would follow. So now he had this conundrum. Narada's on one side, these authorities are on the other side describing what to do and so forth. So now, First, I'll read the verse 12. One cannot avoid the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, not by the strength of severe austerities, an exalted Vedic education, or the power of mystic yoga, physical prowess, or intellectual activities, nor can one use his power of religion, his material opulence, or any other means, either by himself or with the help of others, to defy the orders of the Supreme Lord. That is not possible for any living being from Brahma down to the ant. And then the purport, the word manishaya by intelligence is of special significance. Everyone okay? Okay. You listening in the front row? You paying attention? Priyavrata might argue that Lord Brahma was requesting him to accept family life and the responsibility for ruling a kingdom, although Narada Muni had advised him not to enter household life and be entangled in material affairs. Whom to accept would be a puzzle for Priyavrata because both Lord Brahma and Narada Muni are authorities. Under the circumstances, the use of the word Manishaya is very appropriate for it indicates that since both Narada Muni and Lord Brahma are authorized to give instruction, Priyavrata should not neglect neither of them but should use his intelligence to follow the advice of both. <laughs> nice, huh? <laughs> Got to use your intelligence. To solve such dilemmas, Srila Rupa Goswami has given a very clear con conception of intelligence. He says, Anasaktasya vishayan yatarham upayunjitaha Nirbanda Krishna Sambande Yuktam Vairagyam Uchite. Vishayan, material affairs should be accepted without attachment, and everything should be dovetailed with the service of the Lord. That is real intelligence, Manishaya. Becoming a family man or king in the material world is not harmful if one accepts everything for Krishna's service. That necessita necessitates clear intelligence. So there's a way in which this uh, section of the Bhagavatam is giving us a very clear understanding of how one must work in this world, maintain loving relationships with one's family, and so forth. But at the same time, be in, internally attached to the orders of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and to go on cultivating the process of bhakti yoga. Is this working for you all so far? Any complaints? Not too far on a limb for anybody? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna read you one more verse in purport. This is verse number 18. One who is situated in household life and who systematically conquers his mind and five sense organs is like a king in his fortress who conquers his powerful enemies. After one has been trained in household life and his lusty desires have d decreased, he can move anywhere without danger. Purport, the Vedic system of four varnas and four ashramas is very scientific, and its entire purpose is to enable one to control the senses. Before entering household life, grahasta ashrama, a student is fully trained to become jitendriya, a conqueror of the senses. Such a mature student is allowed to become a householder. And because he was first trained in conquering his senses, he retires from household life and becomes vanaprasta. And soon, as soon as the strong waves of youthful life are passed and he reaches the verge, sit still, of old age at 50 years or slightly more. Then after being further trained, he accepts sannyas. He is then fully learned and renounced person, a fully learned and renounced person who can move anywhere and everywhere without fear of being captivated by material desires. Senses are considered very powerful enemies. As a king in a strong fortress can conquer powerful enemies, 
So a householder in Grahasta ashram, household life, can conquer the lusty desires of youth and be very secure when he takes vanaprastha and sannyas. So, resting my case, there's a way in which this very practical instruction, Manisha, you have to, uh, you have to actually, if you're grahasta, you have to be there. You actually have to be in the ashram and have these loving exchanges because if you become cold and different, you try to artificially be renounced in a, in a situation where you're not actually, then you'll disturb the whole family and your mind will also be disturbed. The loving uh, relationship has to go on at the same time one has to be internally attached to the process of devotional service and go on cultivating it um, simultaneously. So this is one aspect of what I'm talking about loving exchanges because uh, sometimes people artificially... Um, Manjula Kanta said that there's a way in which sometimes we do the opposite. Internally attached, but externally and very... You know, I act like uh, I'm a great yogi and detached from the family and, and treat them very coldly. So this is not what the Bhagavatam says to do in the Grahasta Ashram. Clear? Did, it, did I make a case? So this is a balance that one must perform. Now there's another point which is that one, and it was mentioned in the first verse that we read, one must regularly associate with saintly persons. And this is parallel with the verse, dadati pratigranati kuyamakyati prichiti. These are the loving exchanges which are described, six in number, in the Upadeshamrita by Rupa Goswami. Does everyone in the back have a comfortable seat? Can everyone check and see, please? Make sure they're sitting on something comfortable. And can you also make sure they can see that the chairs aren't blocking? Everyone should have seats. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Great to see you all. Hare Krishna. That's better, it was blocking some of the energy. Hard to see everybody. So in the verse, Tadati Pratigranati, it says that uh, one should, uh, one must engage in these six loving exchanges with devotees of the Lord. So those happen to be listening very carefully, going to saintly persons and listening. There's a kind of loving exchange in that when you go to listen to somebody and they're speaking from their heart. There's this exchange that takes place, which is very deep. Uh, someone who's, who's serious about spiritual life and really wants to listen and learn and render service. This is described in the Bhagavad Gita. Tadviti pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya uparakshanti te jnanam jnaninas tatvadarshina. When one uh, wants to advance uh, in knowledge, then one should approach somebody who's advanced in that knowledge and render service. One should uh, be very submissive and inquire, be inquisitive. Then there's this uh, very powerful exchange that the, all the person's experience that they've gained throughout their life, all their realization, they become inclined to give it. Uh, as When you render service to someone selflessly and you inquire, um, and Prabhupada says absurd inquiries are prohibited. Absurd inquiries means you, you know, it's not really inquiring because you want to know something. There's a, there's a discussion you can hear Prabhupada in Japan when he first went there. He asked for any questions. And someone asked, have you ever seen Lord Indra? Have you ever met Indra? And this was probably considered an absurd inquiry because he said, what's it to you? Who, what, how does it help your spiritual life if I've met Indra or not? So the inquiry should be you know, directed towards how to advance in spiritual life and so forth. And, and when that happens, when there's that uh, exchange, that's called a loving exchange. Kuyam akyati prichiti. And the, uh, the person who, uh, the advanced person's heart actually melts because of meeting someone who's seriously inquisitive and submissive 
and rendering service. That person feels obligated, the heart melts, and the contents of the heart come pouring out to that person. That's a real loving exchange. Guyam Akyati Prichi. What's secret, what's guyam, what's normally hidden from the regular, from the normal public, doesn't tell to anybody else because they can't handle it, because they're not interested in it, because they would profane the, the, the very thing that he, he or she is speaking about. It comes out in that setting. So this is a loving exchange, and this is extremely important for staying in devotional service, one must regularly have these kinds of exchanges with people who are more advanced than oneself. Then there's the other two other loving exchanges, which are, actually there's four other, because there's the giver and the receiver. As I said, there always has to be two. Those are? Okay, gifts. There has to be an exchange of gifts. So this is one of the uh, two of the loving exchanges, giving, and then Prabhupada says in his purport, one must be ready to accept also, take those gifts. So th that's a loving exchange that takes place. And then the, the last two? Yeah, prashadam. That means that bhunkte uh, bojayate chaiva, there's a way in which uh, one gives prashadam and receives prashadam from those who are uh, devotees. And in those loving exchanges, it's very powerful. Now, as in all society, there are, diff there are complexities when one has relationships. Am I correcting, assuming that? Or is it all just really nice all the time? Which one? Complexities most of the time? It's hard to get along with people. Even in devotional societies, there's all kinds of fights and wars and scratching and... I'm not talking to you anymore, and all kinds of stuff that happens. So it's important to, to uh, f for our longevity in devotional service and our stability to learn how to, besides just you know these exchanges, to learn how to actually uh, live with others in a very positive way and, and stay in these loving exchanges. Uh, one thing I would point out at the outset which I think is excellent advice that I think I'm taking from Dale Carnegie. But, uh, and that is, sorry for the delay, is to accept the fact that all great relationships are completely peaceful. They're not always completely peaceful, sorry. <laughs> In other words, it's a myth that they have to be completely peaceful. And we see in the Chaitanya Charnamrita the dealings between Lord Chaitanya and his devotees, and the devotees with the devotees. Sometimes there are uh, disagreements. Sometimes, for instance, in the past time, which I've mentioned more than once in this assembly, between uh, Shiva and the Saint, excuse me, well, there, that's one, but uh, Shiva's. Shivas Thakur, who was watching the Rathayatra, and then Hari Chandana, who is the uh, sort of the bodyguard for the king, who was uh, Maharaj Pracha Parudra. And it was during Rathayatra, so it was obviously hot, it was a hot time of the year. <laughs> and Srivas was watching, trying to watch Lord Chaitanya dance, and so was the king, who was standing behind Srivas, couldn't see. So Hari Chandana was touching and pushing Srivas, who did, couldn't understand why he's being touched and pushed and disturbed from trying to watch Lord Chaitanya. So he turned around and he slapped Hari Chandana. <laughs> it's in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And he was about, Hari Chandana was about to say something in retaliation. Wouldn't you, if you were slapped? Maybe, you think about it for a second. <laughs> but then Maharaj Prachabruja said, I'm not so fortunate. I have not been slapped by a pure devotee. And he calmed the whole situation down. So don't think that just because there are some, in your relationship, there are some things that happen. They'll happen all the time in our loving relationships with devotees. There may be, you know, times that I'm not talking to you. <laughs> or or some, some of these things. Actually, in the spiritual world, we see Krishna and his friends they have these, sometimes there are these arguments that take place. 
Everything comes from the spiritual world. So there's arguments there, there's arguments here. And, you know, sometimes uh, Krishna is uh, asked not to come around when Radharani is angry and, and, you know, lamenting and angry at him. He'll come and the gopi, the other, her, her friends will say, she doesn't want to see you right now. I'm not talking to you. And so forth. So the point is that there are, there are in relationships, there are differences of opinion, and life goes on. So it's to start with to understand that it's not that they're always harmonious completely. That's utopian. So given that fact, and the fact that it is important not to commit offenses and that one should cultivate uh, loving relationships with devotees, there are a few uh, points, practical points, of how to uh, live with others in a very, as harmonious way as possible. So one thing that's very practical, which is to not focus on the differences, but to look at the similarities. And this, there's a tendency, oftentimes, to see the difference, rather than, this, that, than what we have in common. So one, one way in which uh, we can actually advance is uh, because we tend to f focus on differences rather than the similarities, is to take a look what we have in common. See how our, our interests are the same. Another is to uh, step back when you're um, not in completely in harmony with somebody and uh, try to look at their good qualities. Now, Lord Chaitanya brought this out when he was approached by a Brahmin who said, I've made offenses to devotees using my tongue. I've criticized them, so what should I do? And Lord Chaitanya said, now you should glorify them. He said that the criticism is like drinking poison and glorifying the devotees is like taking the antidote to poison. So if you think of somebody who you have a difference of opinion with or you're not talking to or you have a grudge against and you try to glorify them or appreciate their good qualities, try to pick out what are the good qualities within that person and focus on them or even speak about them, then, according to Lord Chaitanya's prescription, you can actually turn your mentality around and repair the relationship. Another way which is uh, very practical in all spheres of life is to uh, take an interest in people. And that requires finding out about them. For instance, in a community, how often do people actually go out of their way to find out how others are doing? I see in some communities, for instance, particularly in Laguna Beach Temple, uh, Rupanuga Prabhu, a devotee who has a very specific service every time there's a, a gathering at the temple to go around and meet everybody and see how they're doing and take an interest in their life. Do you think that makes a difference? It's a huge difference. And I see it right in front of my eyes that just because he takes an interest, how are you? How's everything going? Uh, and ask them questions about their life and so forth. Taking an interest in somebody else um, doesn't take that much time and effort. Sometimes it does. Depends how, <laughs> how connected you are to them. But the fact is that it makes a huge difference. And how often do I do that? Do I actually take an interest in how others are doing? Sometimes incidentally I may do it or when there's a, a disaster or when there's somebody sick or something like that, I'll take an interest, how are you doing? And generally, people don't, it's a superficial thing. People say, how are you doing? I'm okay, how are you? I'm fine, see you later. 
it, it, it stays on a very superficial level. So you don't have to go very far of taking an interest in others and seeing how they're really doing to um, make this bond, which is part of the loving relationships with other devotees, it makes a huge difference. What are the couple of things I've named so far? First one. Look at the similarities, don't look at the differences. And then? Step back when you have an issue and try to find at least three qualities that are. And then appreciate and glorify the good qualities. Then the third one was? Take an interest. OK. So one thing I've taught in my Sankirtan seminars is uh, to imagine that everyone has a sign around their neck that says, make me feel special. Do you remember that from the seminars? Yeah. Can you imagine everyone in this room having a sign around their neck saying, make me feel special for a second? Can you see that? Everyone appreciates being uh, made to feel a little bit special, don't they? Or do they like being neglected and sort of, you don't even look at them? I was in a temple, which we'll go and named for about a week, and there was a young man coming to the temple every day, every morning for the morning program, and I went up to talk to him, and I, I said, how are you doing? He said, great. I said, how long have you been coming? He said, a couple weeks, and I said, I asked him, you know, where he came from and everything like that, and he said, I love this, Christian conscious. He said, I just have one uh, slight concern, and I said, what? And he said, you're the first person who's talked to me. <laughs> He said, he said, I've been coming here for a while, and nobody's actually even really looked at me. And there's a way in which you know, everyone can get to doing what they're doing and not really take an interest in other. But what really you know, holds together uh, these relationships and creates a, a community full of, of loving exchanges is when people go out of their way to take an interest in other people. Who are you? Where'd you come from? And so forth. It's really surprising, actually. We don't really know that much about the people we see regularly. We just sort of assume certain things. And um, if you uh, go by, it doesn't take much to make, feel, make somebody feel special. In other words, you don't have to invent something or be artificial. You just have to make eye contact and really talk to the person and find out how they are and so forth. Hey, you turn to somebody next to you and see if it works. You can just turn to somebody and make them feel special in any way that you can. On your mark, get set, go. It's hard at first, but then you won't want to stop, right? <laughs> There's some hugging going on over here. I see some talking, some eye contact. Some devotees are looking a little nervous. It's a little nerve-wracking. Like, well, I'm not going to talk to that person. <laughs> Some handshakes going on. And now look around the room and see the atmosphere. Everyone's kind of laughing and feeling good, right? A loving exchange means you give some attention, some real attention to people. If you do this all the time, you, you know, you create a community that really has... Uh, a powerful base. And when there are disturbances which will come up, then devotees, the, the people who are coming, they really know where to take shelter. This is what's really important, these loving exchanges. And there's a way in which everyone has to have these because there will be times when you're really shaken in your life, when you need this kind of uh, deep friendship with other devotees. And it has to be there in order to hold you in your devotional, in devotional practice. Just, um, if you have any motivation, if you have any motivation in your heart, when you start advancing in a society, and let's say you make it to the top spot, whatever that is, but you have the motivation, you'll feel very lonely. It's very lonely at the top. Because there's nothing really fulfilling in this world unless you have a relationship with Krishna and a relationship with the devotees. And it's actually worse. When you finally get to the top and you go like, there's nothing here. I'm empty and I'm full of motivation. And then you're really, it's really scary. 
because you can fall down from that position. And, and then what do you look for? What do people look for when they f fall down from a, spirit, a, a position of spiritual authority? They go off and they look for some kind of relationship somewhere. They need a relationship. So the, the point Rupa Goswami is making, start with the relationship. That's the foundation. You have to have these relationships with, with devotees, loving relationships, which means you're getting together to talk about things that really matter. And, and it doesn't always have to be just Krishna Kata, although it's good to have really strong doses of that regularly. You also have to, you know, deeply talk about anartas and how to get rid of them, and also how to balance your regular daily lives and find out from others, get encouragement from them that you're doing okay. Because this world's a very discouraging place. Everywhere you go, the material energy takes pot shots at you. And, and you need encouragement from people on the inside who are helping you keep going. When your mom dies, when your dad dies, when, when your dog dies, when your cat dies, you need somebody to call up and say, I feel, I feel like I just got beat up. I feel like three guys just pounded me with shoes and I'm lying in the corner here. I, I can barely move, you know, please help me. You have to have that. So bhakti includes this, uh, this uh, array of exchanges between devotees, loving exchanges between devotees. We're not mayavadis. We're not trying to merge into something impersonal and become void, and therefore we avoid our family members. We treat them like, uh, you know, I don't need you. It's the opposite. But internally we're cultivating, we're actually seeing them the way we're detached on an inner level is we're, we're actually seeing them as Krishnas. They belong to Krishna, not to me. So even on the inside, it's not that we're cold or uncaring about them. We actually care more than anything else. And externally, it's okay to, to practice the loving exchanges that we normally see in, in this world. That means kindness, generosity, acknowledging what people are going through or, or being, reaching out and being nice to them and so forth. It's very important because in the spiritual world, there are, that's what there is. It's all loving exchanges. And so we have, there's a way in which we have to balance our internal, our external relationships and um, be very uh, practical. A couple other very, actually I'm going to stop there because there's only a few more minutes. There's a lot more material to talk about on this and this is just sort of preliminary run at this uh, subject. But let's just see if there's any reflections or questions. Gadarvika and then Harivangsha. So, uh, Prabhuji, the, the way in which the life in Bay Area works, like nobody has the time, first of all, to, to understand because even if I want to, because it's running from one to do to another uh, task. So even if I get to talk, because the so services are there, so you tend to talk about that. Even for that, you don't have much time. So how in, in that sense, how, how do long we really does it take? doesn't take long at all. Okay. Uh, just to give you an example, that uh, there's a, uh, a, a, a leader in North America. There's a top leader in North America. And... You know, he does, does so much service all the time. And then about a year ago, or maybe it was two years ago, I wrote him a, a, just a short note. took me about 10 seconds. I just said, you know, it's amazing how much service you're doing. I, I really admire you. Thanks for walking the earth. And I signed off. And he wrote back this whole letter. He said, nobody ever tells me this. <laughs> he, said, he said, everyone's, I mean, when you're at the top, it's, it's uh, the higher you climb, the harder the wind blows, and so forth. And, and just heavy criticism, you did it wrong, this and that. I, I mean, you're really in the limelight and so forth. Our relationship since then, I mean, I really meant it. I was just watching him and appreciating everything he was doing for, for North America and ISKCON. And I just wrote him a note. It was two lines. And... It, our, our relationship became so like intimate. I just noticed how he goes out of his way. He, like, there's this connection now, because I expressed my appreciation for what he was doing in a real way. And not in a demonstrative way. I wasn't glorifying him in front of a big crowd. I was just saying, of course I am now, but it's anonymous. 
But I'm just telling you, it, it, was, it was a real thing, and it made a huge difference, and it took me 10 seconds. And I'm saying, when you have that inspiration in your heart, take advantage of it right then, because it doesn't always come back. When you're appreciating somebody in that moment, you're thinking, I really, like I saw in the, you know, coming across the WhatsApp, everyone was appreciating Sukeshri, and they're being empowered all of a sudden to distribute sets of Bhagavatams, and everyone's like, really appreciating Sukeshri. I mean, when you feel that inspiration, don't hold back, because we're not Mayavadis. It's okay to go out and appreciate people and say, yeah, I, you know, it's a loving exchange. It's real. Do that. It's important. And it doesn't take time. It really doesn't. It doesn't take much. It takes one, if you take the time to give somebody a little bit of attention for five seconds, it can change their whole day, their whole life. That person said, I'm okay. They really like what I'm doing, or whatever it is. Yes, Hari Vamsha. Hare Krishna. Thank you for a wonderful class. <coughs> Thank so, you. That really made me feel... <laughs> <laughs> Because I was kind of wondering if. <laughs> uh, so, um, in Rupa Goswami also, and you also mentioned that, for example, the grahasthas they have to take association of saintly persons, and um, in the verse Krishna Thiyas Giritam it says that you have to really die to take association for those really advanced than you. But more often than not, we may not have that association around us often. Also, I have heard many times they say that at some, after a point, it's like 80% 80, 80 of the time, most of the time, you should have equals of friends around you in devotional <coughs> service. Most of your interactions and exchanges are with them and very less will be those who are much more advanced than you. Can you elaborate on this? What is well, one this? thing is, for somebody who's um, very open, hungry, humble, uh, he finds or she finds advanced devotees everywhere. I mean, actually, you could even find in neophytes uh, this kind of advanced, what you're looking for. It's not necessarily you have to find somebody who's, you know, a certified saint. <laughs> there are lots of uncertified saints walking the world, actually. You know, and, and you might find, you'll find them in, in unlikely places if you're really open and, and you're a miner. There's a song, I'm a miner for a heart of gold. Neil Young, you knew that, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, keep me searching for a heart of gold. I'm looking for a heart of gold. Where is it? It could be anywhere. I mean, look, this part of the story of Maharaj Rahugana, he's being carried on a palanquin, and he can't see any good in anybody because he's high and mighty as a king being carried around. And he starts criticizing his palanquin carrier, who turns out to be Judd Bharat. And Prabhupada mentions in that section, you should be careful who you're talking to. You really don't know who they are sometimes. I've had the experience at Rathayatra more than once, thinking that I was talking to some new person. And, you know, maybe feeling a little condescending, and it's like, turns out they joined the Krishna Conscious Movement in 1967. <laughs> <laughs> and they just happen to be like undercover for the time being, and you know, and who are you talking to? So it really, it's your perception of who's advanced and, and, and so forth, and it's how you treat people, what comes out of them, you know, how you interact with other people. Even with, with somebody who's a newcomer, you might find a jewel. It comes out of somebody who's, you know, they're there because they climbed over two fences and came across, you know, the desert in order to be there. And you just happen to pick up on that raw enthusiasm when they walk in the door and you renew your devotional service, right? And as far as other kinds of association, that comes by grace. We have to pray for it that, you know, please give me the best kind of association and give me the intelligence to take advantage of it. Over and over again, we have to pray for that. Because oftentimes good association comes and then I don't, I don't recognize it. And I don't take advantage of it because I'm too busy or I'm not interested or so, and so forth. So it's, uh, it's not an exact formula also, I don't think. I mean, not an exact formula. Kanka. 
when I say not an exact formula, I mean that really it's based on our on our desire. Yes. Um, I was thinking too. In this day and age, we have we're so fortunate because we have DVDs, we have CDs, we have so many ways to take advantage of a saintly association. In that way, like, because um, and then also, you know, we have our iPods, we have books, we have books, <laughs> <laughs> we have a book on on whatever it's called. <laughs> I'm not up on all that, but. The, then uh, the other thing is that I'm so glad you're talking about this because in Krishna consciousness it's our it's a very personal um, process of bhakti yoga and it's so important these loving exchanges it's so important to be personal and kind and caring and loving and um, I was when we were they were flipping through all the um, different slides of Krishna I was at first thinking, wow, I'm so glad that I have Krishna in my life. And then I went, wait a minute, Krishna is letting me into his life because all these pastimes are coming along on the, on the film. So I'm actually being allowed into Krishna's life. So, so many things. And I'm so glad you're talking about Rupa Goswami. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Kanka. Hi, Krishna. So I think we're out of time because we have about two minutes left. I could take half a question. Yes. Okay. You want to add something? There's a microphone. Go ahead. I was also going to, um, I was also observing that when there is a, um, when there is love, then you make time for the person that you love. So, you know, there's a 10 second and there's the other extreme. And I wanted to quickly add that some time ago, um, Rakesh Prabhu had forgotten his very favorite thermos um, mug at the Harinam in Palo Alto, and we were t and we had reached home, and uh, we started dialing if anybody was there. And Kamishwari Mati picked up the phone, and she had already left the place, but then she went back, you know, drove back to get the jug for him. And my husband commented, he said, you know, only a devotee can do that. You remember things like that. Somebody goes out of their way for you. Things like that makes it real. You want to make real quick? Thank you, Shraddha. That was nice. Oh, thank you, Prabhu, for the nice class. Uh, the one point I just wanted to add was that, uh, you know, um, the comment from Dale Carnage where, where he was saying that, you know, not all perfect relationships are peaceful. Uh, just to add to that, that, even the Pandavas, they were all their own uh, personality and they had a lot of differences among themselves. And uh, still they stuck together and they, uh, uh, you know, it, it was kind of a perfect relationship but it was never, it was not peaceful all the time. They had their own differences of opinion, they had their own uh, personalities which came out at different um, times. Yeah. And a lot of that comes out in the letter Prabhupada wrote to Trey Rishi about don't expect utopia. And, and that there are differences of opinion even in the spiritual world. And there are apparent anomalies because that's, that's there in variety. Everyone's different. Every living entity is different. Vancha kalpaturbasha kripasnabe vacha patitanam pavani bio vaishravi bio namo namaha. And now we're going to stand up, put all the asans away, and chant Hare Krishna to our heart's content. Nachari armarman, Nachari armarman, Nachari armarman, Nachari armarman, hey, Nachari armarman, Nachari armarman, Nachari armarman, Nachari armarman.